In a year of momentous happenings, 1988 would see an historical changing of the guard in Pakistan. Unlike her opposition, Benazir Bhutto's Pakistan People's Party had a charismatic and seemingly competent leader. We could have taken over power yesterday if my party had believed in violence, if we had believed in bloodshed. That crowd was so respons responsive that we could have taken Lahore yesterday, but my party did not want bloodshed. My party does not want violence. Benazir had cleverly built up the momentum of her final days of campaigning taking full advantage of the fact that the president, General Zia, had died in a plane crash a few months earlier. There were scenes of near hysteria wherever she stopped. The once unlikely prospect of a 35-year-old woman becoming prime minister of this Muslim nation of 104 million people was now a reality. By the grace of God, our majority is so overwhelming that we believe that they might fail despite these efforts. and. Uh, We'll have to just watch and see how many seats they attempt to rake. But as far as the public is concerned, it's there for everyone to see. On November the 16th, 1988, in the first open election in more than a decade, Benazir Bhutto's PPP won the largest block of seats in the National Assembly. Bhutto was sworn in as Prime Minister of a coalition government on December the 2nd, becoming at age 35 the youngest person and the first woman to head the government of a Muslim-majority state in modern times. As Benazir took her place in the National Assembly for the first time, the House broke into spontaneous applause. It was the beginning of a new era for Pakistan, and 1988 would also see a new age emerging in the USSR. Mikhail Gorbachev introduced glasnost in the Soviet Union, which gave new freedoms to the once oppressed people, such as a measure of freedom of speech. This was a radical change, as control of speech and suppression of government criticism had previously been a central part of the Soviet system. The press became far less controlled, and thousands of political prisoners and many dissidents were released. At the same time, Gorbachev opened himself and his reforms up for public criticism. The law on cooperatives, enacted in May 1988, was perhaps the most radical of the economic reforms during the early part of the Gorbachev era. For the first time since Vladimir Lenin's new economic policy, the law permitted private ownership of businesses in the services, manufacturing and foreign trade sectors. Under this provision, cooperative restaurants, shops and manufacturers became part of the Soviet scene. In Estonia, for example, cooperatives were permitted to cater to the needs of foreign visitors and forge partnerships with foreign companies. Aeroflot was split into a number of independent enterprises some of which became the nucleus for future independent airlines. These newly autonomous business organizations were encouraged to seek foreign investment. Just as unprecedented freedoms were now becoming a reality in the Soviet states, affairs in other parts of the globe were taking a turn for the worse. Iran Air Flight 655, flying from Iran to Dubai, was shot down by an American missile over the Strait of Hormuz, killing all 290 passengers and crew aboard, including 66 children. According to the US government, the crew of the USS Vincennes mistakenly identified the Iranian Airbus A300 as an attacking F-14 Tomcat fighter. However, the Iranian government maintained that the Vincennes knowingly shot down a civilian aircraft. Later, as part of a settlement, the United States agreed to pay $61.8 million in compensation for the Iranians killed. The United States did not admit responsibility, nor apologize to the Iranian government. In May, the International Olympic Committee was still keeping the door open for North Korea to participate in the 1988 Games. And the result was a boycott of the Games by North Korea, which was still officially at war with the South. 1988 was a year of change of economic and political freedoms, and a year that will be remembered as a year of momentous happenings. In a year of momentous happenings, 1989 was a year of disasters, protest, and the breaking down of walls. It seemed that 1989 was off to a good start. That was until the supertanker Exxon Valdez ran aground off Alaska in March, proving that environmental disaster could strike the United States in what was their worst ever oil spill. Later in the year, catastrophe continued for the U.S. when a powerful earthquake hit Northern California. 
Caused by a slip along the San Andreas Fault, the earthquake lasted approximately 15 seconds and registered 6.9 on the Richter scale. The quake killed 63 people, injured over 3,000, and left some 12,000 people homeless. The tremor struck the San Francisco-Oakland Bay area during the evening rush hour, when the Cross Harbor Bay Bridge and its approach road system were jammed with commuter traffic. I had been under the impression that the highways uh, had been constructed to deal with any severe earthquake, and I am uh, very surprised to, to see what has happened with some of those, and I think that uh, uh, we are going to have to have some inquiry with respect to that. As one superpower is reeling from the effects of disasters, across the globe, 1989 was a year that saw momentous happenings shake up the communist regimes of China and the USSR. After nine years of controversial occupation, the Soviet army finally withdrew from Afghanistan. With over one million dead Afghanis and five million refugees fleeing to Pakistan and Iran, the Soviet occupation had achieved little and left behind a breeding ground for Islamic fundamentalist terrorists. When the novel Satanic Verses went on sale in Paris, it was as though fuel was put to an already smoldering fire. In little over an hour, Customers bought up all 1,000 copies at one of the biggest bookshops in central Paris. The book was condemned by Muslims as blasphemous, and the late Iranian leader Ayatollah Khomeini had urged Muslims to kill the book's author, Salman Rushdie. It shows that this is the latest stage in a campaign that began with smears and vilifications and distortions of the book, which has escalated through all sorts of levels of violence. And frankly, uh, uh, I wish I'd written a more critical book. I mean, a religion, a religion that claims that is able to behave like this, religious leaders, let's say, who are able to behave like this, and, and then say that this is a religion which must be above any kind of whisper of criticism. I mean, that doesn't add up. It seems to me that, that, that Islamic fundamentalists could do with a little criticism right now. Although the leaders of France's three million Muslims had condemned the book, they stopped short of making death threats in public after the French government had threatened to take action against them. Security fears delayed publication in France and many stores were still too scared to stock the book, which was banned in most Islamic countries. Rushdie, who had been born in India to a Muslim family, went into hiding under police protection. Back from the shame of Afghanistan, the USSR was now facing a momentous happening that would see the beginning of the end of the hammer and sickle. Under mounting pressure, East Germany's ruling Communist Party threw open its borders to the West. In the 28-year-old symbol of the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall began to crumble as the political map of Europe was changed forever. Within hours, the first of an estimated 1.4 million East Germans who had applied to emigrate began arriving in West Germany and West Berlin. As 1989 was drawing to a close, another communist regime was seen for further momentous happenings. The president and general secretary of the Romanian Communist Party, Nicolae Ceausescu, and his wife Elena were executed by an army firing squad following a so-called secret trial which had been shown on Romanian television. During the trial, the couple were convicted of the genocide of 60,000 people who died in the popular revolt. They were also found guilty of hiding more than a billion US dollars in foreign banks and of undermining the economy and the country. After the Ceausescu's death was announced, people rejoiced in the streets. 1989, a year that had seen the introduction of bans for ozone-depleting chemicals and a measure of freedom and justice restored for millions, was truly a year of momentous happenings. As a new era of space exploration was beginning, 1990 proved to be a year of momentous happenings in European politics and the beginnings of equality for South Africa. Under the reforming leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet Union was facing dramatic changes to a 70-year rule of law. Glasnost and Perestroika, the Gorbachev policies of openness and restructuring, were giving the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania more confidence in their demands for greater autonomy. This soon became an open call for total independence, and by March, Lithuania had declared its independence from the USSR. Subsequently, the Congress in Russia declared a new law that a republic could secede if more than two-thirds of that republic's residents agreed. The political commentators could see the future unfolding, even if the politicians did not. I think Gorbachev foresees uh, the future of the Soviet Union quite, uh, 
quite clearly. It should, it should become, well, I don't know in how much time, but it should become independent Ukraine, independent Russia, independent Georgia, uh, independent, say, Baltic states. So they have to work out their platform this way, because sooner or later they will be faced with this problem. As Soviet troops were withdrawing from occupied territories, Lech Wałęsa, the shipyard electrician who had led the Solidarity Trade Union in ousting Poland's communist leaders, became the country's first democratically elected president. While Europe was reorganizing and drawing up new maps, astronauts on the Space Shuttle Discovery were releasing the Hubble Space Telescope using a robotic arm. Once out of the cargo bay and disconnected from the shuttle's electrical system, the Hubble began running on its own batteries. Electricity generating solar panels were activated from the side of the telescope to power its sophisticated cameras and sensors. The Hubble is the only telescope ever designed to be serviced in space by astronauts. The ongoing repair program will allow the telescope to remain in service until at least 2013. While NASA was preparing for decades of scientific discovery, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein made decisions that would change the immediate future of the oil-rich Gulf state. By August of this momentous year, Saddam Hussein had ordered his troops into an invasion of Kuwait. Within hours, invading Iraqi forces had occupied all of Kuwait City's installations, setting up roadblocks at major intersections and cutting fuel and gas supplies. By overrunning and confiscating Kuwait's oil fields, Iraq was estimated to control some 20% of the Western world's oil supply. Economists were foreseeing a global crisis for the economy. The rise in oil prices does threaten a rise in inflation. It does threaten um, growth. There may be a world recession flowing on from this. Over the following weeks and months of 1990, the United States President, George Bush Sr., rallied a coalition force from 34 countries to the aid of the Kuwaitis. When he was released after 27 years as a political prisoner of the South African government, Nelson Mandela was the world's most famous prisoner. This living legend had come to symbolize the fight for black nationalism and opposition to apartheid. Mandela's years in prison, many of them on Robben Island, for crimes that included sabotage committed while he spearheaded the struggle against the oppression of apartheid, had not made him a bitter man. Following his release from prison in February 1990, his switch to a policy of reconciliation and negotiation helped lead the transition to multiracial democracy in South Africa. Mandela has frequently credited Mahatma Gandhi for being a major source of inspiration in his life, both for the philosophy of non-violence and for facing adversity with dignity. In a year that had also seen the resignation of one of the world's leaders, Maggie Thatcher, the British Prime Minister, stood down as leader of the Conservative Party and resigned from her position as the leader of the government. 1990, truly a year of momentous happenings. In a year of momentous happenings, 1987 was a year of justice, daring and drama on the high seas. It had taken more than 40 years, but the wounds were so deep that when two former Nazis came into the news in 1987, few had any sympathy. When the butcher of Lyon, former Gestapo officer Klaus Barbie, was finally sentenced to life imprisonment for crimes against humanity, he found it hard to get anyone to support his side of the story. One of the weightiest charges against Barbie was that he had ordered deportations to the Auschwitz gas chambers of 44 Jewish children aged between 4 and 17. Barbie, who had not cooperated during the trial, was brought against his will to the court wearing handcuffs and surrounded by a police guard. The former Nazi secret police chief in Lyon from 1942 to 1944 stood with his head bowed during the 40-minute reading of the verdict. When Adolf Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, died in Spandau prison, it was just another chapter in a story that had been colored with speculation and conspiracy theories. On the eve of war with the Soviet Union, Hess had fled from Germany and flew solo to Scotland in an attempt to negotiate peace with the United Kingdom, but instead was arrested. He was later tried at Nuremberg and sentenced to life in prison at Spandau, where he remained until his death. 
When West German teenager Matthias Rust also flew solo across international borders and put his Cessna aircraft down in Moscow's Red Square, the world was bemused at this young man's daring flight into the Soviet Union, which ended with his landing right on the Kremlin's doorstep. Rust, who had flown via Finland to Russia, said he had decided to highlight the absurdities of the East-West standoff over arms control. The Russians, who were not amused, promptly sacked the air defense chief before sentencing Rus to four years in a Soviet labor camp for hooliganism, blatant disregard for aviation laws, and for breaching Soviet airspace. Another man who did things differently was pop artist Andy Warhol. When he died of a heart attack at the age of 59, the art world mourned the passing of a man whose knack of changing the mundane into art extended to his lifestyle. Warhol, whose silver hair and large glasses had become his signature, said he was motivated by two overwhelming ambitions, to be outrageous and to make money. He achieved both as the high priest of pop art. Warhol, who trained as an illustrator, is best remembered for a series of paintings faithfully depicting a can of Campbell's soup, which effectively launched the pop art movement during the psychedelic era of the early 1960s. This was followed by similar paintings of money, soap pads, telephones and typewriters, all of them totally indistinguishable from photographs of the originals and montages of Marilyn Monroe and Jackie Kennedy. Unmarried, Warhol lived with his mother in an apartment on New York City's fashionable Upper East Side. With over 500 passengers and crew on board, the ferry Herald of Free Enterprise left Zeebrugge, Belgium, just after 6 p.m. on the 6th of March, bound for Dover in the UK. Shortly after leaving the harbour, Water began flowing into the car deck and the unstable vessel capsized almost immediately, coming to rest on its side in relatively shallow water. A subsequent inquiry found that the ferry had left the port with her bow doors open and with extra ballast still in her tanks. Neither of these alone would normally have been a problem, but when combined they proved to be fatal. Rescuers worked through the night and brought more than 400 people out of the ship alive. Many were taken to hospital, suffering from cuts and bruises, hypothermia and shock. The final death toll was 193. The disaster had unfolded in just 90 seconds, in calm conditions and shallow water only 100 metres from the shore. 1987, a year of justice for war crimes, daring and disaster proved to be a year of momentous happenings.